Good morning, Hope. Good morning. Hi, Donald. So make sure everybody, make sure you got a bulletin. There's a lot of good information in here, and there's more stuff than what I'm going to talk about here really quick. Get a bulletin, fill out the communication card in the bulletin. We have Sunday school available outside and nursery at the end if there's any young children that want to go there. 
We have the job, seek, uh, job Seekers Workshop coming up. There's details in the bulletin, or you can see Chris Oakley for information about that. We have the Blitz Ministry is looking for volunteers to help get um, food and supplies out to the local homeless in our community. Um, be, fill out, be sure to fill out your communication card in your bulletin. We're getting ready to be putting together a directory. We just want to make sure we have all your information right. Okay, here's some big ones. We have a children's ministry meeting coming up on February 21st at 1230. This is for anybody who is involved in children's ministry, wants to be involved in children's ministry, has children, likes children a little bit, come to the meeting, it's gonna be good information. <laughs> so it, it, we're doing a little bit of restructuring, reprogramming, so come to that so you can get all the information you need. We are having a rummage sale on February 19th and 20th. We're gonna, we've started collecting new and gently used items that we can sell. We're accepting donations on the 17th and 18th from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., I believe. So come and bring your donations. Come to the yard sale, to the rummage sale as well to help and to buy stuff. And now it is time to stand up. So everybody is going to stand up and talk to three people about the growth group that you're going to. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing
oftentimes we don't know or understand what God is doing, but he's always working. Just like when Jesus was sent to the cross, Satan thought he won, but he didn't know what God was doing behind the scenes. The man who died for us poured out his love, sacrificed his own life for every single one of us. God was working. As we take communion this morning, let's remember our Savior, the cross that redeems us, the God who worked and made a way so that we can be sons and daughters of the one true King. Let's remember Jesus. Your love reaches to the heaven. Yeah. 
Hey, Hope Church, second service, you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see all of you, and we thank you for being here. Let's give it up for the most dangerous worship band on the West Coast, Hope Rising. Thank you, guys. Um, we had a really packed house uh, first service, and I'm wondering if some came to the first service who don't typically do, because I heard there's something going on today on TV or something. None of us are concerned about that, right? Actually, there may be someone here that you got dragged here and you're kind of wanting to get home and get on with the show. So I brought something to help you not be distracted by the game. I thought I would wear this mask while I'm preaching today. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, uh, I'll just put it right there so you can pay attention to the message. Uh, right? Thank you. A spiritual man right there. Uh, let's do a survey. How many are uh, believe that Peyton Manning and the Broncos are going to win? Whoa, a little stronger contingent, I think, than the first service. How many believe Cam and uh, pa the Panthers are going to win? Oh, Broncos a little loud. How many of you could care less? <laughs> That's how it was in the first service. How many of you could care less because the Niners aren't in it? Yeah, you are the, the forces with you. You just keep praying for a miracle. Hold on. Don't stop praying. Hey, uh, one thing I wanted to show you. Uh, yesterday, we had 10 people go on a hike, uh, a mountain last night, on snowshoes. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And this young lady on the far right, uh, Mardell, I asked her for permission to tell everybody her age this first service because I had to ask permission because my, my wife taught me you never ask a woman her age. But she's, I think she said she's almost 81, about to turn 81. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? That is so awesome. And this, 
This, uh, I love our mountain uh, climbing and hiking ministry because it's a picture of something that uh, I'm working on putting together for classes. It's getting harder and harder to do, like all new membership individually classes. We're going to have to go to a small group format, and Gina and I are working on that process. But to create a spiritual development process, and we're going to use the mount walking, climbing the mountain of God as an illustration. And I'm praying that the landscape ministry uh, are going to help me when I get that pile of stuff cleared out back there to have a labyrinth or a walk where you can walk around the edge and there'll be little places to stop to meditate and pray with five spiritual principles and those will be taught uh, quarterly uh, or occasionally in in seminars and the first one the first M is membership that's when you say I'm in you know what does it mean to be a member of the church a member of the body and and when you go on a hike you kind of together go I'm in you start walking together and build relationships then the second M is maturity and as a Christian we go through spiritual disciplines and things and experiences sometimes trials when you're hiking it's elevation you start sucking wind or you get tired right and you're 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 crying out to God and then you get finally to the top of the mountain and that's the magnification, the third M, that's worship, mag magnifying God. When we sing together, we express love to God and we magnify him and he touches us and our prayer is that our, our, our worship spills out into the streets and we go out of here changed by God. And God doesn't want us just to stay on the mountain right now, amen? Eventually we're going to get to go be with him forever, but r right now in this fallen world, he wants to send us down the mountain. So the next M is ministry. You find your shape, you find what God shaped you, skills, abilities, experience to minister to others. And, and then the final M, as you get at the bottom of the mountain into the world, that's mission. Uh, we are a part of a mission to the world until we go home. And so the mountain uh, uh, is a great picture of that. Um, and I love that the picture of different ages, different backgrounds also. It's, it's what the kingdom's about. And we had so many good things going on this week. We had our growth groups and Bible studies. We had yesterday men's breakfast, great turnout. We had um, a, a wedding here that was led by Pastor Tom. So you know there were some jokes going on in there, right? And uh, then uh, there was also the hike going on. And there's just so many good things going on. We can't keep track. And would you join me and, and praise God for what he's doing among us here at Hope? So awesome. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, I joked about maybe, you know, keep praying, believing a miracle for the Niners to make it. And t the truth is I really want to touch you today. I'm praying God will touch us in a deeper way because I believe in an audience this size, just because of my career, not because of my career as a pastor, but also being a Christ follower, I know that sometimes there's people praying and praying for a long time for something, and maybe they're not seeing the results. They've been praying their heart out, and they're not seeing the results that they're praying for, praying for someone you care about, for their, uh, them to have a relationship with God, to come to Christ, praying for your children, concerns, praying for healing, praying for finances, praying for a breakthrough through a habit or an addiction, uh, praying to be able to forgive something and let go of it, praying uh, to break through depression, uh, praying for your parents. Maybe your parents are having a hard time in their marriage and you don't want to see them divorce, or, or maybe praying because they're aging and you you weren't ready for this. You like them taking care of you. You don't want to take care of them, right? And you, want, you didn't get a blueprint on how that all works out. Um, praying for your own marriage, for your spouse, for things to be like you'd hope they'd be, and they're not where you want them to be. Praying through loneliness and not getting the answers. I believe that God is going to do something for someone today in a, an audience this size. I believe it, whether you're here among us or you're watching from a computer screen. I believe he touched some people in our first service because that's how God works. And this text is a beautiful text to illustrate that in Daniel 10. Remember last week, and I love following last week's lesson because it was about prayer. And it was prayer that helped Daniel to go into a pit with lions because he trusted in God. Whether it worked out or not, God is sovereign. And he had been praying for decades, and that's what got him through that God when you drop to your knees before God you can then stand before men and uh, God you, you trust God with the results so this week we continue with the ideal of prayer now Daniel's an older man than he was and he was around 80 we said last week in Daniel 6 he's an old man that has decades upon decades of prayer and a relationship with God he's standing in faith he's a 
captive, that was taken captive from his homeland in Jerusalem, and now he's uh, been lifted up because of his leadership skills and so forth. Uh, and he has on his heart the rebuilding of the temple in his homeland, in the city of Jerusalem, the city of God. If you know Old Testament history, God taught a lesson through the Israelites, through the Jews, of what he's always wanted, to have a relationship with his people and that he would be our God and we would be his people. And, and, and the other nations had all kinds of multiple gods, little g, and temples where they did some weird and wild stuff. And God was different and he was holy. That means he's set apart and, and he loves us. Us and we have this healthy relationship. That was his plan. But Jerusalem, uh, they, they gave into the pressures of the world and thought, well, we need the other stuff too. And because of losing their faith in those areas, God said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And he allows them to be brought into captivity by other nations. But he always promises through the prophets that one day he would restore a faithful remnant because God is faithful to his promises. And ultimately, who is he going to bring through the Israelites? Jesus. He's going to bring Jesus so that all nations, even us Gentiles, we can be grafted in to the family of God, forever family of God in Christ. And so Daniel's reading things like Jeremiah. It mentions in Daniel 9, he's reading the promises from Jeremiah the prophet, and he sees these promises, and he sees the doom that's happening. He's praying for God to carry out those promises to restore them. But then he gets a vision in Daniel 9 which is of more warfare, and it scares him, and so he goes on a fast. He goes on a 21-day fast, and it says uh, that he put on no lotions, which means he didn't bathe. I just want you to know when we do our 24-hour prayer chain, we do bathe. But Daniel, he doesn't bathe. He just prays. He's, you know, it's a sign of humbling yourself to put sackcloth and ashes to get down before God in and, and humility. He's praying for the Jews to be freed, for them to rebuild the temple, the city of God. And now, in his crying out, another vision comes. It, and, and it's at the end of this fast, and it's the end of this 21-day period, and he sees a man. Now, some scholars believe this man is Christ. Remember, Christ is eternal. He started in the flesh at Bethlehem, but he is an eternal part of the Trinity, or the part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he's always existed. He's the Logos who created all things, and he, uh, a lot of scholars believe there's places where he shows up, like uh, well, through Melchizedek with Abraham, he shows up with Joshua, and some scholars believe this is another one. Others believe it's just an angelic being from God. We don't know for sure. I'll kind of preach it like it's both or could be either one. I like leaning on Jesus because Jesus is the creator anyway, and angels represent Jesus anyway. It's kind of like the little boy in Bible class, and the teacher says, what is brown and has a bushy tail and climbs up trees to eat nuts? And the little boy goes, uh, Jesus. The teacher goes, no, it's a squirrel. And he goes, well, it sounded like a squirrel, but I thought because I'm in Sunday school class, I'm supposed to say Jesus, and God would be pleased with that answer. And so we're leaning toward Jesus, but uh, Daniel is going to have this vision now. Let's pick it up in Daniel 10. If you've got a Bible, you can go there. If you've got a Bible app on your phone, you can go there. You can look at the notes and the PowerPoint. It says, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist, his body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning, and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished brown, bronze, excuse me, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Sounds kind of like John's revelation. We don't know for sure if Jesus, by the way, those appearances that are proclaimed to be Christ are called Christ, Christophanies. I just thought I'd share that with you in case you wanted to share it with some of your friends this week. I want to talk about Christophanies, and they'll go, huh? But uh, it, we don't know for sure, but this, this incredible being is there, and he says, Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. Sometimes God has something just for you. Did you know that? It's okay for you to understand that sometimes God has something just for you. In fact, if you've been falling for a while and God's gotten a hold of you, maybe by a certain text in the Bible, it just spoke to you. And you may have read it before, but all of a sudden it had new meaning, and you're like touched by it. And you may share it with your friend, and they're like, 
uh, yeah, what are the appetizers we're going to have at the Super Bowl party? You know, they just don't hear it. Or it's a song, you know, uh, that the lyrics just really speaks to you. And others around you are like, yeah, the coffee's pretty good. They're just not hearing it. They're not touched by it. Sometimes God has something just for you, and others don't understand. Those who were with him saw nothing, and they're terrified. They run and hide. He's alone. And God is going to move something in you. And I believe there may be some people here today that you've been praying for something and you've been asking for it faithfully and you're not seeing significant results. And I'm praying God may speak something to you today from this example in Daniel that God's going to touch you um, and others may not see it. I got a friend named Jim Roberts who uh, he had a coffee business up in Portland and it went public. And in the process of it going public, they'd hired a consultant. And uh, he and I became close friends and we're studying the Bible. He was into the Word. He's an English major. Uh, old hippie from Eugene, Oregon, started selling coffee and different things in the uh, uh, fairs there. I realized people will pay money for cheap, for lousy coffee. You might as well charge a little more for good coffee. So the company's about to go public. He's in Isaiah in a text where it's talking about the wrath of God. And, and, uh, and it says, I've got blood on my garments, blood on my garments. He's in a hotel, Wall Street. His company's going public. The consultants, all his business people are so excited. He's going, look at this verse, look at this text, I've got blood on my garments, what's this about? And they're like, yeah, whatever, they didn't, they didn't really want to hear it, you know. Uh, and sometimes God touches you in a way, and it doesn't touch others around you. Notice what he says, my strength left me, verse 8b, it's the second part of verse 8, my strength left me, my face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. This sort of takes away the ideal of some of the old portraits of angels being these little chubby babies, you know, uchi Gucci babies with wings on them, you know. Every time an angel or a being from heaven shows up, people fall down, pass out, or scared to death. Also, if you've ever experienced God in a strong way, the strongest of men cannot bear the weight of the glory of God when God gets a hold of your heart. If you've ever experienced and grieved about your sin and then shed tears of joy when you understand God's grace, knelt in his presence, you kind of understand this weakness in the presence of God. Um, you know, I in my own life, when God first called me was one of those experiences. I had been uh, having fun with sin. Was, by the way, who believes sin is fun here? Anybody? No? Oh, there's one person out there. The rest of you, a couple, the rest of you are either lying or you haven't done it right, okay? <laughs> if, there, if there was no fun in sin, there would be no temptation. It says in Hebrews that Moses chose to be, go through ill treatment with the people of God rather than the temporary pleasures of sin. The problem with sin, there may be some fun in it, but it hurts us and it hurts others. And God's he cares about us. He's not worried about our behavioral modification so we can earn our way to heaven. He already knows we're never going to do that. And he has a way at the cross, as Jane has shared, for us because of his love. And he, he made that happen behind the scenes. But in my life, I thought, this isn't working. I'm getting beat up in the world. And I felt a call to study the Bible. And I was seeking him. And it became apparent to me that I need him more than anything else. I tried a lot of stuff, and some things weren't all bad, but, but, but they, weren't, they didn't complete what I felt in my heart for meaning and purpose. And I wanted to go study the Bible. I actually laid around and was quiet, which I don't do very often. And people, what's up? And some of my friends, when I shared, I'm thinking about going to study the Bible, they they didn't feel the, the touch, right? Later, some of them, God let me baptize, or we got to share faith together. But at the time, no, they didn't see it. And there's times in your life where others may not see it, but you see it, you feel it. And today, I pray God is going to touch you as you come to truth about these three things we're going to look at. I just want to say this, by the way, as we go into it. It doesn't stop at your quote-unquote conversion. I believe all your walk, as you try to serve God, be a Christ follower, you're going to need a touch of God. You're going to need a reminder that God is all you need. We get in trouble when we think it's about us. And I've spent hours, uh, like in the cabin when I first moved here and lived out there, and praying, God, we need musicians. 
and God, we need a children's ministry teachers, and God, we need this ministry. Because I learned through ministry that if you try to do it all, you burn out pretty quick. You know, whoever burns the candle, both ends not as bright as they think. And, and so for long range, you got to pray, and you get to pray. And sometimes I felt an impression of God saying, you have everything you need right now to be the body of Christ. Be who I call you to be and continue to pray. And that never ends. It can be about an event we're going to have. It can be about Easter. It can be there's this feeling of over, being overwhelmed. And how's, oh God, please. And God will say to you, you have everything you need right now. Remember the disciples? How are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus said, give them what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. Give them what you have. And someone here today, maybe you haven't had that moment with God. And I want to say to you, if I believe this with all my heart, if you seek him, he will make himself known to you. So how do you keep on standing in faith uh, when you, you're trying to believe things aren't going as you had hoped, you're not seeing significant results. We're going to see some great examples. We're moving to application of this text. I'm not one of those who just wants to know some stuff to fill my head up with. I want to learn how does he want me to apply it and how will he help other people as they apply it. We're going to apply this right now. So buckle your seatbelts, fasten your tray table. It's about to get exciting here. The first point to understand if you want to stand firm in the faith is that God cares about you more than you do. God cares about you more than you do. Notice this text from Daniel 10. It says, just then a hand, he did what? Touched me and what? Lifted me. A hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very what? Precious. Precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you and do what? Stand up, for I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up, still trembling. Now, if I could sing Right about now, I'd have Kara, our, our keyboardist, break into kind of an or, organ sound. And I would start to sing to you some words from an old famous hymn that I grew up singing as a kid. But I don't want to do that to you because you won't come back if I sing. <laughs> In fact, I think it's sickening that Gina can be sick and still sing like that. Uh, my brother, uh, we have these Uncle Ron-isms. My big brother is Uncle Ron. My kids know Uncle Ron-isms. One of them is, I wish I had a voice like hers and she had a feather, then we'd both be tickled, you know. <laughs> and you know one thing that really makes me sick is preachers who can preach and sing. I think that's kind of disgusting, don't you? <laughs> So I'm not, I'm not going to sing and I'm not going to do that to you, but I'm going to read the words from this hymn. From sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. The hand of God doesn't extend to you today to condemn you. You need to believe the truth that the hand of God extends to you today to lift you up. He always wants to lift us up. The hand of God is not here to slap you. You know why? You are very precious to God. And some would say, quit preaching that watered-down gospel. Let those people have it. Listen, it takes a stronger faith to continue to love. Love is a stronger power, and I believe the real strength of the gospel is not a hate monger, be people up gospel. It's a love. It's what God says. You are precious to me. It took me a while to learn that lesson, but God says that to you today. I hope you'll hear that today, that he loves you with an everlasting love. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Now, there's some people that I love I don't necessarily like, I'll be honest. God loves you and he likes you. You know, I love my kids and I like them and I, most of the time. And I love my wife all the time, like her, uh, you know. But like when I go to the gym, my spin class teacher, I don't necessarily like sometimes. You with me? You know, she, she wants me to work harder, right? She won't get me to, and so it's a little bit of torture. And being precious is valuable, though. God says you're valuable to me. 
I want you to stand firm because I love you. You are precious to me. I'm, he's reaching. He's touching to lift you up, to stand up. Number two, if you want to stand firm, you got to remember that God is doing more than you understand. God is up to more than you and I understand. Then it says in verse 12, then he said, don't what? Don't be afraid. Every time God shows up and people are trembling, he says, do not be afraid. Presence of God says, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since when? Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. Check that out. From the first day, he started praying 21 days. He's fasting 21 days. And he says, from the first day, your request has been heard. Now, verse 13, it, we're about to go Star Wars here, okay? So hang on. Verse 13, but for 21 days, the spirit, of the, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. What? This is... This is stuff going on that we don't see. There's more to life than what we see. We can't really live just by what we see. He says, from the first day, heaven heard your prayer, but I was busy dealing with this, I believe it's, and most scholars do, some type of demonic force trying to go against God's plan, who is ultimately going to bring that kingdom in Jerusalem, is going to bring the Jews out of eventually Christ. He's working out his plan, and there's a battling by fallen angels. Just as Satan's a fallen angel, he has his hordes, he has his demons. They had our number, they're after us. We believe in the kingdom of light, ultimately he's going to win. We read the end of the book, but during this fallen life, fallen world, there's a battle going on, and there's more to life than what we can see. I want to talk to you who've been praying for a long time. Maybe you felt like, is it worth it? I've been praying so long I feel stupid. Why bother? God's not doing anything with my kids or my grandkids or my career or my, and you feel like giving up. Nothing's going to change. God probably doesn't even care. I want you to hear these words from the text of the word of God. Since the first time you began to pray, your prayer has been heard in heaven. And he tells Daniel, I was detained, but Michael showed up. I left him there to kick some major butt. That's a, a, editing a little bit. To take care of this battle so I could come and finally help you with this prayer that you've been praying for 21 days. And God's been hearing your prayer. God is like a loving father who hears the prayer of his kids. And God likes persistent prayer. God is about relationship. And the first time you prayed, when you cried from your heart, God heard you for healing, for health, for loneliness, whatever it is, you keep praying. And remember from the first time God heard you. Look at verse 13 again. 21 days, the spirit prince, a demonic force, is, is trying to block him. Remember last week, Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. We have an enemy, and it's not the people that may try to hurt us or the circumstances. There's an unseen realm. And I'm talking to myself here. It's so easy for us to forget the spiritual realm. We cannot see God till we move by faith. Amen? Faith is the vision we see God. Faith is what we remember. There's something unseen that's going on. Daniel started praying 21 days earlier. Looked like God wasn't doing anything, but God was doing more than he understood. Just because you don't see anything yet doesn't mean God isn't up to something now. You know, when I, uh, when I hit my 20s, I started freaking out a little bit because you're getting old, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm supposed to get married. Only problem is I don't have the right one, you know. I, I want to get married, and, and uh, I had this little list. I, be, I don't believe, by the way, there's this only one perfect person for you to get. Remember we studied that in the the dumb things smart Christians believe that there's only one perfect person for you. There's this blueprint for life. And if you pick the wrong person, you screwed up, you're toast. I, I believe you can have things by faith that are important and, and certain values that will help you achieve success. But not this, you know, there's only one and all that. Uh, but I had my list of things that I grew up with from my mentors and my parents. And one was a person of faith. Uh, I, I wanted someone who was beautiful inside out. I know 
the insight's more important, but I was kind of, God could be kind of get both together, linked together, you know, inside and out. And then I wanted someone who valued family. My parents drilled it in me. Marriage is for life. Marriage is life. And, and important family is important. And, uh, and I know in a fallen world, it's not always easy. It's difficult. And so I was really concerned about that. And I kept praying about it. Even though I had stuff going on in my life, I knew I wasn't right. I, didn't, I needed to change. I still had a prayer life, and I believed in God. And uh, I went through some lonely times during that time period, and not the best relationships or experiences. And I kept praying to God, and I was that right person. I felt so lonely. And then when I met this person, I had this hunch. I just knew this was the person, the family values, the uh, being a babe, uh, and then uh, <laughs> the God value. I just knew it. And fortunately, she was so young, she didn't know what she was getting herself into. But uh, now, years later, 36 years or whatever later, I'm convinced more than ever that that was an answer to my prayer. And when, you know, when I prayed for a place for us to live, and I know housing is not as important as spiritual issues and family, but I prayed for a good place for our family to live and to build good memories with our kids and have friends over, and I, and I wanted to do that. I only had one problem, sometimes I didn't have any money. And uh, sometimes we had to wait and live in houses or, or duplexes or places that were the, the walls were so thin you could hear people thinking next door, you know. And, and sometimes we lived in busy cities and places, but in time, uh, I could see God took care of me and gave me that place. In ministry, um, you know, in ministry, being a pastor, you, you go and it's kind of like, you know how if you ever look for a house or a car and you have a list of things you'd like to see and you'll find some things in one place, but you, it's hard to get them all in each one. You know, you go to the house, well, it doesn't have the fireplace or doesn't have the garage you'd like to get. If I could just get all that list, you know, I, I want a winch on the truck, you know, or I want, if I could just get all the things lined up together. And for me, personally, there were always good things in every church I've worked with, but it may have been that there was, there was loving, friendly people, but there was so much tradition, and I felt sometimes we put more emphasis on the tradition. Is there a place where we can just make Jesus the only rule? And then I got to work with people where... Um, it was, it, it was friendly and loving and good, and God did a lot of great things, but maybe we were a little worried about the worship change, you know, about being too free in music and things that we did. And, and I had this heart of it I liked, that I kind of liked, that I thought there was people we could reach it with Christian lyrics. But I, and then I got to go to a place where there was freedom in the music, and we had kick in music, and we had friendly people, uh, but there wasn't a real outreach individually thrust where the people were inviting their friends, and there was a buzz, creating a buzz like I was hoping. And then God let me come to my favorite church as an old dude. I believe it's my last one. I'm not in a hurry, Lord, to take me out, and I hope you guys won't boot me out soon, but as far as I, this was my dream church, uh, where all those things, friendly people, kicking music, I don't call it contemporary worship style personally. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to judge others who call it, but our worship is ancient future. We worship an ancient God and we look forward to a future, and different ages have used different styles from the contemporary. So I understand that phrase, but our worship is not just some cool new contemporary. It is ancient future. I'm in tears every, work, every week as we worship this ancient God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen? And then I get to be with people that are not only friendly and we have the freedom to worship. Uh, we're not hung up on traditions of men. We're not here to condemn denominations who want to do it their way, but we just want to follow the Bible and just be followers of Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. I get to do that here. And then I get to be with these people that are actually will invite people. They actually re reach out to people. And it, it, it wasn't always the way. There were times when I was hoping, I felt like it was time for me to preach. And people were saying, yeah, you should. But God didn't answer. The, the opportunity wasn't there. Or a certain ministry, the opportunity. You pray and you pray and God hears you from the beginning. And then you look back sometimes and go, he was working it. He was accomplishing. Just because you're not seeing it right now doesn't mean God's not doing something right now. And he hears you from the first time you pray. And he loves you so much that he's working behind the scenes for your good. And he will work all things for the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So number one, if you're going to stand firm, and I'm going to stand firm in the faith, we got to remember God cares about us more than we do, that God is doing more than we can understand. And number three, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. You got to get this one down, folks. I got to get it down. I got to remember it. Because we can get duped into thinking it's about us, our strengths, our abilities, our ministry, our whatever, and get a head full, and it's not. 
and we will fail when we do that. God is all we need. God is what we need. Um, anybody ever uh, lift weights very much? Seriously, you know, uh, I don't do it a lot now because it, I've noticed it's not always a muscle issue. Those those tendon things that hold them together, they get weaker. Have you ever done that? You've got to wait for a long time. You can't do anything. So I try not to do too much of that. I do the, the, the cardio or something here and there. But back in the day when we used to pump iron a lot, we would do these things. And you have workout partners a lot of times, and we would do these things called burnouts. At the end of a workout, you take a light weight, and you do as many reps as you can, right? And you first start, like some of you may have done 21, so you do curls, and you go like this seven times, and you go seven times, like, that's not that bad. Then you're like, Ugh, you know, uh, or bench press. You take, you may have like a little five or a little tiny weight on there, not even weight. You could have just the bar, and you first start out, and you're doing this, right? And you got to, where's the spotter at? They're over your head, right? They're, stand, they're here ready to help you and yelling at you, usually spitting on you a little bit, and you're laying down right? And you start off 20 reps, and you're like, oh, this is a joke. I hope nobody sees me benching the bar, you know? And you're like, 30, ah, this, this ain't bad. And you get to 40, and your boobies start to burn, you know? You're like, oh, oh, oh. And your friend starts going, come on, you got this. You got this. You got this. And what do they do when you're about to lose it? They reach under, right? And they lightly begin to help you. And sometimes you get to the last five and you almost laugh because they're saying, you got this. And you're going, no, I don't got this. You got all of this right now. You got all. That's exactly how it is with God. When we get to the end of our strength, he goes, I got this. I got this. And our, our weaknesses are an opportunity for God to bring about his strength. Until you understand your weakness, you won't appreciate God's strength. You know, uh, when I started the ministry, it was about, uh, a lot of the preaching was behind big pulpits, pulpits of wood. You got to say pulpit for some reason. Pulpits of wood. And I, and I like my mentors, and I don't fault them, and that was their generation, and there's some who may still do that, and that out of respect that they feel, and I honor that. But for me, it felt a little foreign. It was like this big wooden thing, and I'd wear the suits, and I, I, I'm a Freitas brother. We'd do cufflinks, and we'd do... Uh, suspenders or three-piece suits. I'd get a chain with a watch through there sometimes. He's styling. My dad taught me, you shine your shoes. Always shine your shoes. The thing about that, though, is you can impress from afar with great oratory or whatever. But when you remove the barriers, you have an opportunity to inspire up close. You know why? They go, oh, he's got some real things to work on there. God's still working through him. Maybe there's hope for me. I would rather inspire than impress from afar. You inspire from up close. And God wants to work through our weaknesses, not just our strengths. You know, our world glories in strength. You don't put on your resume, well, I'm prone to overeat. Sometimes I can procrastinate. Uh, uh, I can lose my temper, but I'm enthusiastic. There's a, you know, I like people, right, you know. Uh, we we, we got to hide our weaknesses in this world. Nobody today is going to, when their team has a penalty, they're not going to go, great, we blew it, awesome. Oh, he made a bad pass. Yes, if it's somebody we're rooting for, we glory in strength, right? Strength. It's the opposite in the kingdom of God. And uh, there's one of the reasons I believe that, and I'm going to share another one in a second. In Daniel 10, 17 through 19, he says, how can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone. I can hardly breathe. Then the one who looked like a man touched me, and I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid. What's he say? Don't be afraid, he said, for you are what? He repeats it. You are very precious to God. Peace. Be encouraged. Be strong. I believe God brought you here today to hear that. Don't be afraid. You are very precious to God. Peace. Be encouraged. Be strong. That's why we're here to hear that from God. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 12 I absolutely love. Paul says, I had a thorn in my flesh, and I asked God three times to remove it. He has a relationship with God, and he's healed people. He's planted churches all over the, the known Roman world. You kind of think he's a good guy, and he's healing others. But you know what God says to him when he asks him to remove it? No! He says, no. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. All you need is my grace, for my power is perfected in weakness. 
So Paul says, I will therefore boast about my weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When's the last time you had a, a party, you got together with friends? Let's boast about our weakness. Okay, you go first. <laughs> Mine's gossip. I can't wait to hear yours, you know. We don't want to do that. But when we do, who gets the glory? When we admit our weakness, we say, oh, it's, it's not my gift. It's a gift God gave me. It's not all about me. It's a ability God gave me, and I don't know how long I got it. And any good, any growth, any positive. Our world says as long as you're strong, you can work here. But you get a little older, lose some skill, you're out of the way because we glorify strength. Not God. All your life, this old man, he'd been praying for decades, didn't get the answer he was hoping, he's waiting on it, and God says, you are precious to me. He touches him, he lifts him up, and he, and he tells him that his power is made perfect in weakness. Until you understand your weakness, you won't appreciate God's strength. And sometimes we have to wait, we don't know the answer, but it drives us to our knees, and we remember who's really in charge, and we say, God, please help with this situation. So don't you dare quit praying. God heard you from the first day. Your friends may think you're nuts or crazy. Why do you keep trying to stand firm in your faith? You say, because I have a God who cares more about me than I do. And I, he's doing more than I can even comprehend or understand in the unseen realm. And his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Do not be afraid. You are precious to God. Let him lift you today and continue to stand firm in the faith. We sing about him being holy. You know what that means? There's no one like him. Literally, it means set apart. And in a way, he, he makes us holy, sets us apart from our sin or guilt or shame. But he does that. We don't do it ourselves. He, on the other hand, is holy because he is holy. There's none like him. He is set apart. And he wants you and I to adore him. Isn't that a mind blower? We serve this creator God who wants our heart to adore him and praise him. He alone is holy. Amen. He's all you need. He's all I need. Hear that today. You keep praying. You stand in there. He hears you. He will lift you. You know why? You are precious to him. Let's pray together. Father, there's probably someone in an audience this size that's going through a hard time, concerned about it could be their loved ones, that someone they want to come to Christ, or it could be a hurt, something happened to them, it could be letting go, um, it could be a health issue in this fallen world, there's sickness and disease that we will not say is your will. We believe it's some fallen world. Someone going through heavy heart issues, God, and I just pray for them uh, to hear this message today that touch them, that they lift them up, God, because they're precious to you. And uh, Father, thank you that you, you're doing things right now that we don't comprehend and you're working for our good. You're a good God. And Father, thank you that even through our weakness, we don't have the pressure of the world where we've got to prove ourselves. Even through our weakness, you are magnified. Your grace is all we need. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. You all right?
pray for our offering. <laughs> Father, thank you for the joy of giving and being free and take this gift and all of our resources. Use us to be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Amen. Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here. So before we get going, um, we're going to need a lot of help with this. Uh, Gina has lost her voice in the middle of this service. <laughs> and I don't know the words of this song. So it's but you guys do. up to you guys.
You made it. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend. Go commercials. <laughs>